Now, Elmer, the first tweet I saw when you got the job at the Stock Exchange was Elmer von Kukupa. What a cool name. Right. Um, so, and that's what people always ask me is, yeah. tell me about your name. It's a really, it's a great name. So uh, how did you come to get, it's, it's how do you a, pronounce it and how did you come to get I, it? I wish I changed it when I became Australian. I had the opportunity, I didn't do it. <laughs> um, I, it's a German name, although my family came to the Netherlands a very, very long time ago. In Europe that happens over you know, hundreds of years. Uh, my name is actually more impossible than you read it. There's another word in between the two, Funke and the Cooper. There's another word. Uh, it's one of those names where it's great if you're uh, a banker in Europe and it's uh, uh, pretty crappy everywhere else in the world, to be honest, because <laughs> people don't know what to call you. In India, they call me Mr. Cooper. Uh, in America, they call me uh, Copper, uh, because they think Funke is my middle name. It's not hyphenated. Uh, in China, they call me Mr. Elmer, of course, or A. Fu, my <laughs> Chinese name. And uh, you can call me whatever you like tonight. I think <laughs> we'll stick with Elmer if that's it, j just for now. Now, there's another other aspect of your personality which I thought I'd bring out first, and that is that you're a bit musical. Um, so if you do start to tap your feet tonight, uh, I, I'm we'll not. I, uh, you're not uh, as musical. I'm as not as thought. musical as you might think. Um, <laughs> I, I worked for I, when I was a child. I lived um, next to, door to a very musical family. And they were jazz musicians, uh, drum and bass. And so I spent a lot of time in their studio and learned to play the drums a little bit. Um, and so when I came to Australia and got married, um, I decided that I wanted to, uh, and had a house uh, and a mortgage and everything that goes with it, I decided I wanted a drum kit. Um, <laughs> I, I, I bought an electronic one, not a real one, so one that you have to amplify, uh, because my marriage is dear to me and uh, I think I would. <laughs> I would frighten her away if I started playing in public. I only played once in public and uh, with, uh, with a band called Dragon. Do, do you know who Dragon is? Are you old enough to know who Dragon is? Uh, I'm not Australian enough to know who Dragon is. And but you so do I, now. I do now, and I played, uh, I played with Dragon one song called April Sun in Cuba on stage once. Well, that's not and a bad And that was, uh, that was a lot of fun. Yeah. I think. <laughs> so tell us about what, what was it like growing up next to the, um, the jazz family in in the Netherlands, in, in the city, and you, you, um, yeah. mum was an architect. And mum was an architect, was and my father was a pilot, uh, never home, of course, as a result. Uh, but great holidays, uh, that, was, uh, <laughs> that was true. Um, uh, sometimes you read in, uh, in pieces about CEOs that, uh, you know, the hardship of their youth make them a different person. Um, my youth was uh, one big, fabulous experience, to be honest. Uh, I was very lucky, although my parents divorced at a relatively young age, I, I happened to live next to the jazz musicians. And on the other side was a family with five children, all in my sort of age group. And uh, so we lived in a wonderful place, and I just had a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful youth. OK, brothers and sisters? Uh, one brother who uh, came to Australia. He, um, I, I, I flew him over for seven years to go diving on the Great Barrier Reef when, when I came to Australia. And after seven years, he decided, uh, he said, I'm doing this the wrong way around. I should live in Australia and visit Europe. And he packed up his family, uh, and he's here. Wow. He moved on. Yeah. Wow. So is he a, a kind of corporate sector like you? No, he runs his own. Um, this is the ad for my brother. He runs his own advisory uh, firm in, um, <laughs> in uh, occupational health and safety, but in the engineering sector, so mining companies and heavy engineering. Uh, he, he's everything I'm not when it comes to engineering. Uh, <laughs> well, it's good to have an alter ego, I think. Now, one, one question I had about your background is um, you've come via McKinsey, McKinsey, a little bit of AT Kearney, McKinsey, ANZ, yeah. Tabcorp, ASX. We see a number of management consultants these days as chief executives and I'm wondering about the skill set. Is there something about the skill set of a management consultant that actually means they can run big complicated businesses these days? Uh, <clears throat> Well, you warn me that you might ask that question. And so I, I, mean, think, I, I think McKinsey and other major consulting firms yeah. and excellent firms like Deloitte give you uh, a certain uh, You're good a with the ads, I have to say. Um, <laughs> I'll be careful here what I say. Uh, but uh, I, I ended up uh, almost by accident by Mc, at McKinsey, but I think it's a, it, it's a wonderful place to start your career, that kind of firm. Uh, I think McKinsey uh, sort of gave me three things. It, it taught me how to think. And that sounds strange, but it has a, a wonderful problem-solving methodology. So it has a way of mm. looking at complex problems and solving them uh, that is very strong. And those kinds of firms have that. And, and learning that early, even though you went through business schools, you got your double degrees and all that, you know, learning how to think is quite, is quite an, an art and a skill. And, and they do that very, very well. The second thing is it gives you tremendous exposure to 
a wide range of industries and senior management at a relatively young age. So you can okay. see how organizations function, or when they call him McKinsey, not function. <laughs> you know, I mean, this is uh, sometimes how it goes. And the third thing is quite good at people development. So I put a lot of effort into training and your own personal development. Um, the, the problem with it is that it's very, very different from running a large company. Um, and so we shouldn't confuse that experience with the ability to run a large company. Mm. Uh, because uh, McKinsey is a wonderful institution, but it's made up of people who are pretty much like me. Uh, and so people tend to be the same. Whereas if you run a large company, you've got you know, 10,000 people in my past job or 500 people today, it doesn't matter. Uh, you'll find that people are wildly different. Uh, and actually management mm -hmm. is about learning how to people who are, work with people who are different from you. And in fact, it's an essential part. The fact that they're different is one of the strengths of the company. Uh, and that's not something you learn at McKinsey. That you you okay. learn that afterwards. When did you learn that? Um, uh, I, it took a little while for me to learn that. Yeah. I, I joined ANZ at um, 30, I think it was. I, I think I joined the management board when I was 32 or 33, somewhere around there. And um, as, as I was head of risk management uh, at that time. Uh, and I behaved very much like the former McKinsey consultant. <laughs> so I was young, arrogant, God's gift to banking, obviously, because <laughs> look at where I am, and therefore I must be doing something right. If only I keep doing it, okay. I must be the next chief executive of, of a major company. And you then go through a series of experiences that teach you the hard way that um, uh, if you don't change, you will have peaked at a relatively young age, uh. Uh, as opposed to grown at a relatively young age. And that's, you know, you get a few shocks to the system uh, okay. that, that, that make you realize that. Now, the way this works is that we, we want to talk about those shocks to the systems. And one of the questions from, uh, we have some great questions from the alumni tonight, so thanks to those who sent the questions in. And, and one was um, from Simon Ford from Consult Point, who might get some lessons out of this, Simon. What was the most important or define, defining moment in your career? Because that does sound like one of those yeah, learning experiences. Yeah, I mean, it's, um, <clears throat> I mean, there were a couple. I mean, if you have several jobs, there's always a couple of defining moments. But uh, I spent 10 years working for a bank, and therefore that's the longest period I've been anywhere. And I think there were two defining moments in, in that career, uh, one from a job perspective and one from a leadership perspective. The job one was um, when I became head of risk management one month before the Asian financial crisis, uh, which, which, you know, that's just, that's, um, I call that my big break afterwards. Uh, it didn't look like my big break in the moment. But afterwards, when I reflected on it, it was my big break. Because when you're head of risk management, and everything is going fine you don't know if you're doing a good job. Uh, and you don't need to manage because the place manages it. When mm -hmm. things go wrong yeah. is when you learn how to manage or you can show that you can manage. And, and I think that was, a, that was a big opportunity for me yeah. uh, to manage. From a leadership perspective, the big moment was when I was not allowed to continue the job that I loved because the company had made a decision uh, that it was going to reorganize. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that it, um, I was running the retail bank, a part of the retail bank at the time, and they were, they were going to merge a bunch of divisions and create a bigger retail bank, and that's going to go to one person. Uh, you could have been that person, but you're not that person, and we want you to run the Asia-Pacific division because our future as ANZ is in Asia. Uh, well, you've got the skills, you've got to go and buy the banks and do all that stuff, and I love my job, and I didn't feel I was done, or I didn't... I felt I had another 18 months of fun left in that and really enjoyed what we, yeah. what we had created. I was not allowed to do that, and I was seriously pissed off, frankly. Uh, deeply, deeply unhappy. Uh, almost left the bank, in fact. What stopped you? Uh, um, uh, well, partially my wife. <laughs> uh, and, and, and not for the reasons you're all thinking, by the way. Um, uh, her, her advice, to, I spent some time Can we introduce your wife at this point? Joanne. Joanne, yeah. yeah my wife is, my, is a wonderful person. Malaysian, Chinese, uh, about 30 years in Australia. Wonderful She's person. She's the reason you came here. The reason, stayed. Well, the reason I stayed here, yeah. uh, certainly. Um, and uh, she, she basically said to me, Elmer, if you leave, you prove people right. Uh, if you stay, you have an opportunity to prove them wrong. Uh, and I thought it was tremendous advice. Um, and I cursed her name a few times and stayed. And, uh, <laughs> And that was tremendous advice because it allowed me to change uh, because it was a tremendous wake-up call, uh, okay. being at a relatively young age, thrown into that environment, thrown at level of seniority, and then not getting what you want. First time in my life, I didn't get what I want. Yeah. And it was pretty serious. And um, uh, it, 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 
it made me realize in a tangible way that I had to change as opposed to someone tells me you need to change and so I'll do that between 10 and 12 on Friday mornings and the rest I'll just keep doing what I'm doing. <laughs> but real change comes from shocks, not from good experiences. Yeah. And uh, that, that's my big experience. So what did you have to change? Because it sounds like you were very bright technically. Mm. What was the bit you had to learn? Well, we, you know, the, um, if, if you're... Uh, come from my background, um, uh, so relatively bright, you're relatively quick, relatively aggressive probably, very, very results focused, used to working with people who are like you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you tend to go for the goal, um, and you tend to go for the goal aggressively. Uh, and, and that works for a while, and it works if you work with small teams sometimes. We work mm -hmm. in large organizations where you have peers and boards to deal with and thousands of people. Um, the way you get to the goal is as important as reaching the goal itself. And um, I went to the goal the usual way. And so if you think about this as a wartime analogy, so I hit the arms depot, uh, but when I looked back, I also hit the school and the hospital. Uh, and so you create a lot of collateral damage from the behavior uh, that you display because you're not spending time thinking about what you do, how that might impact other people, or how that might be perceived, or you struggle to bring them along, et cetera, et cetera. And um, uh, those are some of the lessons that came out of it. And had some very good coaches around me who helped me, you know, through that, through that period. Yeah. So tell us about, because um, you, you've mentioned to me one of, one of the people who's yeah. helped you through this. Yeah. And how, because that's quite a, that, this is to me one of the most fundamental lessons in business, mm. which is how you bring people along. Mm. And as you say, it's the hardest. But so, so how was it that you got some help around that and, and how it sank in? Uh, I think we did a very hard process in those days at ANZ. Yeah. So uh, the hard process was we hired a, a search firm, uh, like a major international search firm. And we took the management board of the bank, about 12 people. And the search firm went through a process as if they were recruiting every single management board member for their job again. So in your job, here comes a search firm and they're going to basically re-recruit you for your job. Uh, and you got a very serious amount of feedback from that. Both, and by the way, the feedback was okay. This was quite a bit later, thankfully. <laughs> um, uh, as I went through this period, I had a coach for about 18 months, a great guy, uh, who, was, uh, uh, who just helped me think through how to get things done as opposed to what had to be done because I was pretty good at that. And within the bank, I was very, very lucky. There were a few people in the company, uh, the CEO, a fellow called John McFarlane, who's now back in, back in the UK, chairman of Aviva, an acting CEO, great guy, uh, who uh, took a great interest in young people. And so you're very lucky that you work for someone like that who takes an interest in your development because he sees something that you clearly can't and, and he wants to get to it and that was very helpful. Mm -hmm. And then some of our directors were very good. Uh, Jerry Ellis, for example, was on our board yeah. as former chairman of BHP uh, and he was a wonderful uh, a person who every now and then with small things could make a real difference to the way you went about things and, mm. uh, and so I was very lucky to have those people around me. Mm -hmm. And the other aspect to this is that um, when you were learning about risk management as well, there was another lesson that you had which was very much about um, not being told, but actually getting the right information. Um, kind of finding, getting people to eyeball you. Yeah. With, with the news, no matter yeah. how Yeah, so bad. we, we I mean, one of the problems with, uh, with the Asian financial crisis, of course, is, um, you know, banks are not particularly good at knowing their risk. And we see that every day still in banking. Um, and so you gotta, you gotta find a way to trust what you're told is the truth. So. One of the things that we did when the Asian financial crisis hit, I had a few very, very experienced people who've seen it all before working for us. And I took one of them uh, and I said, can you please get on a plane and tell me the truth? That's all I said to him, just get on a plane and tell me the truth. Uh, and he went to the, the countries that were most exposed and because people in those countries couldn't see the risks mm -hmm. because there, there had never been an Asian financial crisis before. So if you're in Indonesia or Hong Kong or Thailand or Vietnam or China, you don't see it. So getting someone to go in there and, and eyeball people and, and then come back and say in no uncertain terms what's about to happen was very, very important mm. to me. Do you see many parallels between 1997, 98 with the, the Asia crisis and what, what we're going through now? In, albeit uh, I wish the zeros, going, there are more zeros. I, uh, I wish what we're going through now yeah. was like it. Because <laughs> mm. the Asian financial crisis was, was a, a big event, but in hindsight, 
um, not such a big event after all. And it mm -hmm. recovered very, very quickly. Nicholas Moore would say it's a V-shaped V shaped recovery. Mm -hmm. What we're dealing here now in Europe in particular is we're dealing, so it was an, a correction, uh, a real estate crisis in the early 90s in Australia, uh, the Asian financial crisis, exuberance coming back to earth. It's painful, but it's not fundamental. The problem that we have in Europe is there's something fundamentally wrong with the design of the animal. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and to have a single currency with such a variety of economies and cultures uh, is a real design flaw. And, and now that people are in it, they can't get out of it. And so they're going to have to make it work. Uh, and I spent two thirds of my life in Europe. I have a Swiss mother, a Dutch father. He lives in Belgium, so I've been all over the place. It's very hard to see how that's going to work. So unfortunately, mm -hmm. they're going to stumble through probably for the next five or 10 years. Mm. Uh, it's going to take a long time. Mm. Now you said to us, um, that, and I'll just fill you in, we, we had an interview with El Elmer um, several weeks ago, and we've got an article running in the magazine next Friday when it's out. But um, to me, a very important comment you made at the time, which, is what, which was that you went through the five stages of grief. And, and this market now is a very different market. There's a generation of investment bankers mm. and market analysts who are going to be forever mm. changed by this. Yes. Um, I, I just wanted to dig into that a little bit more about how you, how you adjust your thinking to this new environment, albeit it's taken us four years already. Yeah, I think in, in our case, of course, as a stock exchange, we now face two big problems, right? Mm. One is the world is not just a good place right now for investment, right? Mm. So equity volumes are down 20%. Retail investors have abandoned the market for cash. And, if, and perhaps that's a good thing for the economy temporarily as you know, the banks need, need that mm. cash. <clears throat> um, so it's a difficult environment. And on top of that, uh, of course, our company was what some people call the regulated monopoly. Um, I would never call us a monopoly because we don't have an exclusive license. It's a big point for me. Nevertheless, we were the only player. And um, that world has been shaken up. We now have competition. We have, uh, mm. we have a second exchange in our country. We might have a second clearinghouse in our country. Mm. Uh, and so our company has to deal with that. And it, of course, it never had to deal with it. And we have very loyal staff, excellent people. But that's a shock to the system. Mm -hmm. uh, after you know, 25 years, the exchange is exactly 25 years in, in its current form. Yeah. And, and that's a shock to the system. And you have to deal with that. And I think our company has dealt with that quite well before I came. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's like any shock to the system, yeah, you go through the, the stages, right? You, you go from denial to anger to acceptance, you know, to response. Um, there's a fifth there somewhere that I, that I forgot. But, and so companies have to go through this quite quickly mm. uh, because you, kind of, you cannot afford not to. And I think we've done that well. There's a lot more to do. Mm. We'll come back to that in a minute because mm. I wanted to. Um, you got to. You, you did a, worked at ANZ and there was the crisis. You got to another approach in of gambling, which mm. is Tabcorp. Yeah. And there was another drama because the market was being cut away from you and, yeah. and so forth. And you do seem to attract these things. Um, you stock want to exchange, just that? as the market is, is, on, the, is on the turn. Or are you attracted to, to companies in I, flux? Uh, I, um, uh, I like complex and changing environments. Okay. Um, um, and although at the bank I did jobs that were sort of more run of, run of the mill <laughs> as well, but I think it plays to my strength perhaps. Uh, so maybe I get invited for uh, as that as a result, um, because they require some problem-solving skills. They require to bring a, a group of people along on a journey that they have never been on, uh, and that's very exciting. And it's it's a, you know, it's a lot of fun. It's not always it doesn't feel fun, but it, but it, but trust me, it is fun. <laughs> well, now, work especially if you can bring them along with you now. Yeah. yeah so I'm and that's and, and so at, at Tapcorp we we had this. Um, uh, you know, one of our industries got restructured, which meant some of the licenses disappeared. It was a shock mm -hmm. to the system. Uh, and we had to deal with that. I think um, I I'm a big believer that you could be very, very honest about the situation that you face uh, and never think about it as something that's personal to you. Um, and uh, I think the demerger of Tap Corp came out of that event right? because we basically realized that the, the structure of the company that we ran, although we had multiple businesses that were all in gambling, mm. uh, they actually had very little to do with each other. Uh, they were really very, very different businesses. So, so running a wagering business with 2,500 outlets and running casinos, 
with uh, Broadway shows and hotels and restaurants, they're very, very different businesses. Um, uh, so you walk into your local TAB or you walk into Crown Casino, you know they're different experiences, right? And so, um, yet for some reason they were in one company. And we realized very early on that that didn't seem right to us. Yeah. And we went on a path to start to separate those businesses within the company and ultimately did what we thought was inevitable. We actually cut, cut the umbilical cord and set them free, which was the end of me. So I, I got did yourself out of a I job. I did myself <laughs> out of a job, uh, yeah, so which, which for my so. career was probably one of the best things I've done. How so? Well, because I think, um, I, I think you've got to be doing the right thing without thinking about your own corner office or what that means for you, uh, I think will ultimately be recognized. And I think I'm a big believer in that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I'm fortunate I can afford to do it too, but, but I think that's not the reason I do it. I mm -hmm. do it because I feel, I feel, we felt it was right. Mm -hmm. We recruited people to take over the two businesses. We thought about at what point the stars would be aligned to do it, and we did it. And um, it was the right decision. It's gone very, very well. You can see now how it's being played out. The casino business is called Echo Entertainment, and you can only, you can only have to read the paper. Uh, I'm just an observer. I'm not involved. Uh, like you are. I know a little bit about it, obviously, but it's been a year now, so uh, I read it mostly from papers like your own. Um, and you can see how that plays out, and that's unpleasant, but it feels right to me. Mm. And uh, so mission accomplished. One of the uh, questions from uh, Ramla Fakri from Deutsche Bank is, and it could relate to this, but what's been the toughest decision you've had to make to date? And do you think you made the right decision? The toughest decision I had to make to date? Gee. Um, I think the merger was a very, very tough decision um, because it affected, uh, you know, up to 10,000 people. It's a, it's a big mm -hmm. thing. Um, it affected a lot of people in our head office, and even though we already separated the businesses and running a holding company, there were, you know, quite a few people who, who ultimately lost their jobs uh, as a result of that. And these are difficult decisions. Uh, but if you execute them, you know, the right way and you're human about it, I think these things. I think business is just that. You know, business decisions are really just that. Uh, there's, um, as Boris Becker once said, uh, when he lost a shock match at Wimbledon, uh, That's going back uh, and it was a shock, an upset result. He said, "Well, I didn't lose a war, and nobody died, <laughs> and uh, so maybe it's not such a bad after all." And I think you know, business at the end of the day is is is, is that, right? And uh, you have to spend a lot of time making sure that the people that you work with, mm. and you're doing something to, that you're genuine about it. It doesn't have to be pleasant, but you have to be genuine about it. And I think then you can manage through those things. Okay. Um, how, this is a really good question from Pascal Juliard. Um, because you were plunged into those, or elevated to those roles at a young age, how did you manage your interactions with those who were older than you when you were leading that ANZ division? Yeah. I think <laughs> and what advice, what advice would you give for others? Uh, <laughs> so I think uh, <clears throat> uh, the good news is I treated everybody the same when I was thrown in that role, I treated everybody terribly. So <laughs> I didn't discriminate on age, gender, <laughs> religion, uh, ethnic background. Uh, so uh, in some ways, it, it didn't matter. I had to learn a lot about managing people of, of any age. Um, I, I, was, I, I, had, I was lucky in that I had, a dis, I had a discussion with the then boss of ANZ, John McFarland, about being head of risk management to start with, because you know he had a sort of he had his doubts initially, <laughs> because you know risk management is sometimes is about cycles, right? So you want someone to have you know scars on his back. You've lost blood before. Before you've been in battles. You were there in 1974 when the oil crisis hit. I was barely born in 1974. <laughs> um, and so the question is, can you run risk management if you haven't gone through a cycle? Good uh, and and I said uh, and I said to him, well, um, I asked if I could disagree with him, and he said yes. So we spent a bit of time talking about that. And I said, well, I've got two observations around that. One, I don't think banks ever learn. Um, and, and I wrote an article about that uh, once, called the, the Vicious Cycle in Banking. Uh, but, but more importantly, it's all about the team. Uh, and so if you have very experienced people running risk management who've seen it all before, right, and say, that looks great, but don't deal with him because in 1961 we lost a lot of money. Uh, that's a terrific skill. Uh, younger people who look at this more as an investment proposition in a portfolio, on, on a portfolio basis, look at this problem very differently. Mm -hmm. And so what you need is you need both. You can't just have me there without the experience. If you just have the experience, you don't get people who think about it differently, so you need both. Mm -hmm. 
And in the end, it doesn't matter who runs it, although I quite like to run it. It doesn't really matter who runs it so long as you have both. And that was a very helpful conversation because it meant that I had a bit of appreciation for the skills base. Then a month later, the Asian crisis hit. Yeah. And I knew that I didn't know how to think, how to work with that because I'd never gone through this. And I sent the most experienced credit person who'd been in the bank for 30 years and I put him on a plane because I knew that he knew what I didn't know. Okay. And then we sorted it out. Yeah. Um, really good advice on that. Mm. From um, Jingming Qian from Golden Cross Resources, what was the, mo the most critical skill for a successful senior executive in the, that you see will be needed for the next decade or so? We're getting a bit ahead of us ourselves here, but uh, somewhere it, it, I want yeah. to go. I think if you, um, I sort of, this interview made me think about what I do every day. Um, or maybe what I, was I don't, going to ask you what I don't do it? every day, maybe, yeah. is more important. Um, you know, I think uh, dealing with complexity and thinking ahead and engaging people in that process in the company to figure out what that looks like or what it could look like is incredibly important now. Mm -hmm. Because in almost everything uh, that we touch, uh, other than perhaps very heavy engineering businesses like mining, but even there the world is becoming more complex. Uh, the interaction of globalization, technology, consumer behavior, um, the economics of business, it's becoming very, very complex and very, very fast. Uh, and I think an ability to make sense of that and have a group of people around you who can make sense of that is going to be an incredibly important skill because mm -hmm. if you miss it, your customers have moved on. Uh, so if you think about uh, a retailer who misses the fact that people are actually going to shop online even though you may not believe it uh, and, and figures that out five years too late um, uh, is, is incredibly damaging. Uh, and so thinking about those complex business, thinking ahead and figuring it out, I think is going to be an important skill for the next, the next, the next target. The other one is um, becoming a more human organization and a more human set of industries. I think we've seen, I think that the chairman of Rio Tinto gave a speech about executive remuneration or said something about executive remuneration I read on the, yeah. online today. And I think there's something in that. Mm -hmm. uh, I think in the 90s and early 2000s, I think we forgot a bit about that. And I think we need to be brought back to earth a little bit. And that's about things like um, the way we deal with uh, the societal problems that we have and, and support those. Uh, topics like diversity and getting se very, very mm -hmm. serious. We saw each other at the lunch about that. We, know, we try to be very, very serious about that. And I think uh, the trick is to be and hard-nosed in business and human about it. And at the same time, think about the complex problems. It's very, very difficult. Yeah. And, and you can't solve them on your own. You've got to have people around you who can help you with it. How do you carry that through into your day? I mean, what, what's the kind of average day like? Uh, I, it's, it's a good question. I don't know, uh, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, I spend a lot of time... Because the thing about being the chief executive, you need mm. to do, you need to create the conditions for success because other people will do the business. Being a CEO is a lot about leverage. Uh, so imagine if you have a 40-year career, some of you may not imagine what that's like, but if you have a 40-year career and you work 60 hours a week, you work about 120,000 hours. That sounds like a lot of hours over your career. If you've got 10,000 people and you can make them an hour more effective in a week, an hour more effective a week. Not make them work longer, but smarter. That adds up to three or four times where you can work in your entire life in one year. So a lot about the CEO is about creating conditions for larger numbers of people to be successful. That's, that's very, very important. And that is about recruiting the right people, training them, taking the nonsense away that gets in the way, you know, real focus on strategy, being absolutely clear about what this is about, and ideally rewarding them. Mm. So in my first six or eight months at, at ASX, I spent a lot of time with our senior management team talking about those things. How do we, we changed our remuneration system um, f from the 1st of July because I felt that it wasn't right for the new environment. I spent a lot of time on that. Mm. And then you have to do what's right for the company. So I spent a lot of time as ASX externally. Um, I, I was smiling when someone said one of the most, 10 most influential CEOs. I think it's one of the loudest CEOs, not one of those 10 most influential. <laughs> so you see me a lot in the media. Why? Uh, because I felt as a company we weren't influencing our destiny enough with yeah. policymakers, regulators, politicians, clients. So mm -hmm. I spend my life out of the office if I can 
because that's what the company needs, I feel, right now, because it's incredibly well run. Mm -hmm. The company will run itself very, very well without me. Well, it's a great business. It's a fantastic it was, it's, business. And, and Do you want to just let everyone know what the EBITDA Well, the EBITDA margin, the EBITDA margin is 75%. Uh, that was mentioned just before by, yeah. uh, by, uh, by Nicholas Thank Moore, uh, who, of course, is also a yeah. customer. Uh, so he's got, a, he's got other thoughts about yeah. that margin too, yeah. by the way, uh, because he pays for that margin. Uh, but it's a wonderfully, wonderful, we are blessed with a wonderful, wonderful stock exchange in this market. We are, mm -hmm. We're the seventh largest in the world. Uh, our market cap as a company is bigger than the London Stock Exchange, bigger than NASDAQ, bigger than Toronto. Mm -hmm. It's almost the same size as the New York Stock Exchange. We've got a wonderful, wonderful business. And so it runs itself very, very well. My job is to take it through this complex period where we have to be much more externally focused. Mm -hmm. Customers got choice. I have to spend time with my customers. I have to spend time with policymakers. I have to spend time with politicians. And that's what mm -hmm. I do. And sometimes I do that through your newspaper mm -hmm. uh, in order to be heard uh, and be part of the debate yeah. because we're so fundamental. So, so you want to hang on to your business. At the same time, there's a lot more going on. There's the fast trading, technology, use of technology for trading. There's, well, you've been out and about talking about dark pools, which yeah. is the off-market trades that, yeah. that are not visible and so yeah. forth. So um, I, I guess one of, the, one of the questions is about where, where, do, um, where does the ASX go in a, in a global market that is increasingly competitive, but where there's big, um, uh, there's organisations across the globe hooking up. So, yeah. Well, I think I'm an, I'm, I've been on the well. record as saying um, uh, uh, we have to be successful domestically. We now have competition. Mm. It's only little, it's 3%. Yeah, but remember, 30% of the Australian market is already being traded away from the exchange. Yeah, still settled. Uh, sure. well, you, well, you say that, but that's yeah. changing too. That's a highly technical okay. question. All right, um, we won't go there tonight. She's doing, but... see, this is a different kind of interview now. Uh, we're doing, uh, and so our, our clients are becoming our competitors okay. as investment banks and brokers internalize trade. So if, if a broker's got two clients who both want to trade BHP, why even send it to the exchange? Just do it yourself. And that's happening yeah. a lot. Yeah. Uh, and of course, we see high frequency traders coming into the world as well who trade down to 150 microseconds. A microsecond is a millionth of a second. That's how fast it is. So uh, we use atomic clocks to synchronize our watches. It, it, it's an extraordinary business. The other thing is, of course, it's globalizing. Capital markets are global and we can't be an island. So I spend a lot of time thinking about and talking to people about how we connect the Australian capital market and our exchange to the rest of the world. Uh, we can do that through a merger. Uh, our company tried to merge with the Singapore exchange uh, two years ago. Uh, that lasted about 24 hours uh, before it was rejected. Uh, yet I think it's inevitable that exchanges will get together and that we'll have a couple of winners. And we as a country need to make a decision about whether we want to be part of that global world and be one of the winners or whether we're going to be a highly successful domestic market, we'll make a lot of money and we'll sell our stuff to China. Um, I think we've got a bigger choice to make and, and that's why I'm so vocal. That's why I'm going with the treasurer to China. That's why we need to be out there and part of the bay because our destiny is as a highly successful domestic business connected to the rest of the world and my mission is to create that. I'm not quite sure what that will look like uh, because politicians and regulators hold the cards uh, and so you've got to spend a lot of time changing the story of our market and changing the story of the exchange so we next time we do something we'll be able to execute if something ever happens and there's nothing to talk about i can assure you uh, right now thank you that was going to be the next question <laughs> this is a, an opportune moment to actually take questions from the audience there's a microphone if you could put your hand up um, keep your questions short and state your name and your organization please i've got heaps but i really want to invite you into the conversation there's one right down the far corner. Thanks. Lauren. Oh, hello, my name's Loretta O'Donnell. I'm Associate Dean Education, Australian School of Business. I've enjoyed your conversation very much tonight. I was in Rio de Janeiro two weeks ago and one of the conferences there was about sustainable stock exchanges. Five stock exchanges signed a declaration, including NASDAQ, that they would only list companies that could demonstrate sustainability. I was just wondering if you might have a view on that. Oh. <clears throat> uh, I must say I've got a real problem with that. Uh, because while on the one hand we should fight the cause, we should never do it to damage 
an industry, a business, or a country. Uh, and uh, I don't think it's up to the exchange, our exchange or any other exchange, to decide whether BHP Billiton is a sustainably a sustainable company. How can I possibly ring up Myers Kloppers and have that conversation with him? Well, I'd rather you I'm do. quite happy <laughs> to have the conversation with him as part of discussions around sustainability and how we as businesses collectively need to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. But I've got a real problem with that, uh, with that stuff, to be honest, because I don't think it's actually going to make a difference. Uh, and I think you're doing damage that actually reduces the potential of those businesses to invest in things that make sense and actually make a difference. And I, I think we shouldn't be as almost arrogant to judge on someone else's behalf. I just can't believe that you would do that. I honestly, I'm, I'm, it's a very strong answer because I'm a big believer in making a difference here. But I think, and business does tremendous damage to our planet, right? And we should stop doing that damage. But there's a process to do that. And I don't think we as an exchange are charged with the responsibility to do that. There's other forms to do it. It's why we elect governments and we can boot them out if we're unhappy. You know, that's why we do it. Oh, and I'm sorry, I've yeah. got a strong view on that. Yeah. I just feel that that's wrong. Okay, good, good answer. Question here. The, the microphone's winging its way to you. Good to see you, Nigel. Thank you, Narelle. Nigel Lake from Pottinger. There's been a lot of discussion in, in the last six months or so about the importance for Australia of building new pillars of strength in our economy alongside resources to support growth over the medium to long term. Where do you think those pillars of strength should be? Um, I, I think that's not an easy question to answer. Uh, I think if you, should, if, you look at the shape of our, if you look at the shape of the exchange today, um, someone said this morning it's, uh, it's two mining companies and four banks. Um, and, uh, and, and frankly, there's a bit of truth in that. Uh, and um, uh, so we are a relatively narrow economy that's really challenged uh, for things that add long-term value, like manufacturing and so forth. And so I think part of the answer is to radically improve the productivity in our, in our economy so that innovation and initi business initiatives has an opportunity to shine. And that's particularly important when the currency is so high. Um, I'm a Dutchman, there's a word for this, a Dutch disease, uh, mm -hmm. in fact, that, that can really hold out an economy. I think we run a real risk uh, of doing that. So, um, and, and so adding taxes, for example, I don't think is a smart thing. Um, deregulation is a smart thing. Productivity is a, big, a smart thing. And we, I think we're getting this, this not right at the moment. The second thing is uh, to connect a relatively small economy to the rest of the world. Um, and, and I think we need to make a choice about that. And, uh, we were an active contributor to the, the paper that Ken Henry is writing for the government on uh, Australia and the Asian century. And I'm a firm believer that we need to integrate with the Asian region, not just trade with the Asian region. Because I think trading with alone is a losing game, mm. very long term. Not in the next 20 years, we'll be fine because there's enough to dig up. But I think long term, that is not, I think, the way to, to do it. And, um, uh, I think we've got some you know, very hard choices, choices to make there. How do we make the mid-course correction on the way, I guess, yeah. is one of them. There's a question here, and any, yeah, if we can come here, thanks. Second row. Large room, one more. Large room, <laughs> athletic, <laughs> microphone, wielders. Thanks for that. Darren Chalice, DH International. Um, Wagering through a totalizator and uh, trading shares through an exchange, what's the same, what's different? Um, uh, it's, it's a very good, and we've, we've heard all the jokes going from one form of gambling to another, right? So we've heard all those jokes. Um, uh, but, but there are, uh, people ask me, so how do you go from Tap Corp to run an exchange? Well, there's a couple of big parallels. Both are substantial public companies, and so there's something about running a public company. Both are heavily regulated. Um, both are going through material change. So Detote used to be the only way to bet. Uh, it's far from that. And the thing that disrupts that is technology. So there's massive parallels there. Um, uh, a slightly less pleasant parallel is that um, uh, when I was there in my early days, uh, in my first year, in fact, Detote didn't work very well during the spring carnival. Uh, and in my second week at the ASX, we were off the, uh, off the air for four hours on an important trading day. So. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, I understand the importance of technology, heavily technology-driven businesses, heavily regulated, going material change. Uh, and from a regulatory perspective, probably disadvantaged a bit because the new entrants don't have to abide by the same laws and rules, the rules that we do. There's a lot of parallels uh, with, uh, with TEPRO, although we're not going to demerge the ASX just in case anybody gets worried about that. It's a wonderful <laughs> business just the way it is. And that's it? That's There's one over here, thanks. Right there. Uh, hi, Ben Bulshakabai, postgraduate student at uh, University of Sydney. Uh, the ASX and ASIC share responsibility for regulating of the financial uh, markets, yet this also seems somewhat contradictory to the goal of being a private company and making a profit for shareholders. I'm wondering, and for example, with the uh, rights issues for small shareholders we had a few years ago, I'm wondering if you think it would be easier if the government had full regulatory responsibility, leaving the ASX to focus on just making profits. Okay, just a show of hands. Who here thinks that the government taking responsibility for things is a good idea? <laughs> I don't want to be unkind. Um, uh, we, we, we used to be responsible for everything that the exchange does, including market integrity. So these things like market manipulation and that sort of stuff, that David Jones issues, uh, very topical. Um, when a second exchange came, um, we couldn't be responsible for market integrity of our own exchange and that exchange. It doesn't make any sense. So we handed that responsibility to ASIC. Uh, and ASIC is doing a, doing a good, I've got a lot of time, uh, despite what people might think, I've got a lot of time for ASIC. I think we're actually blessed with good regulators in this country relative to other uh, Western countries. Um, we still run the listings function, right? So when people want to list, uh, when they want to do financial transactions and they need waivers on the rules, mm -hmm. we do that. Uh, we do that through a subsidiary called ASX Compliance that's completely separated from the rest of the company. Uh, I don't sit on its board. It's got a completely independent board. Uh, and in fact, my key card, although it's in the same building, does not work in that part of the building. Uh, so we've completely separated that. Um, I I'm a big believer that the exchange should do it, do however. Uh, because at the end of the day, um, having an exchange is not just about being a competitive business in your own right. You have to be competitive globally because companies have a choice about where they raise capital these days. Mm -hmm. So our competition is, when it comes to equities trading, it's chi -X and Macquarie and others. When it comes to listings, our competition is Hong Kong, Singapore, Canada, and London. A and so we look at that as applying the rules religiously, but also we think about what is it going to take for us to win in the capital market space against Canada. And I mention Canada because their rules are better than ours to list as a mining company. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so about 40% or 35 or 40% of all the capital raised in mining in the world gets raised in Canada right mm -hmm. now. I think that's not right. Uh, I don't think we're competitive and we put some rules to ASIC to change that. Lift the amount of capital people mm -hmm. can raise, yes. accelerating the rights timetable. The good news for your question is that we can't change our rules without approval from ASIC and the minister. So it's not like we're saying, well, we think it's a great idea to lift the amount of capital people can raise without shareholder approval. Let's go do that. We have to convince the regulators, who take a lot of market soundings, that on balance, yeah. that's a good idea, and they put a lot of shrink wrapping around that so that shareholders are not disadvantaged. So we don't actually, while we invent the change, we don't make the rules. Yeah. Uh, and we just apply them. So I think you should be relatively secure. Well, on that front, and this relates to a question from Stephen McCartney, um, what are you, I mean, you talk about the, the pressures of competition, but what are you doing to innovate? To, um, I know there's been some talk around extending the market hours and, yeah. and so forth, but what else? You, you talked about being more externally focused, but what are you doing? Yeah, so we're doing quite a few things to change the way, um, to add, see, when you've got 98% of a market, um, wonderful place to start, by the way, uh, most of your growth will come from the market because you are the market. Mm. So to change that, you need to do a lot, right? So there's no big, wonderful silver bullet that suddenly makes us 20% more money. Well, there really is. Uh, because, you know, that's just not how it works. So we need to have a lot of initiatives on the go at all time to grow our business. Mm. Increasingly, the wonderful thing that we have as an exchange is we are multi-product, so we do equities and derivatives, warrants, options, futures. 
and we're vertically integrated. We do everything down from the trading down to the administration down to, so if you get a chess statement because you bought some shares, we sent you that piece of paper and we charge for it. Um, and, and so we have all that. That allows us to do things that almost no other exchange in the world can do. Um, so for example, we're about to revolutionize the way you as consumers can buy managed funds. Right now, if you want to buy a managed fund that's not listed, you have to fill out a form. First of all, you have to find the fund. Then you have to fill out a form, send it in. You have to wait. If they want to redeem your money, you're going to have to fill out a form. You have to wait a month for your money to come back. Uh, that's a torturous process. We're going to automate that entire process over the next couple of years, absolutely revolutionize the way that's being done. And again, for us, that's a revenue stream because we can charge for that. Uh, and for our clients, it's beneficial because they get a tremendous amount of cost out of uh, the system, because a lot of people are licking envelopes right now, and it gives them new distribution. So it's an innovation that's been a long time coming. We've got 54 organizations signed up to this project, and it will revolutionize that process. That's just one example of trying to use what we have to do new things. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll, I'll move on to some more questions. So there's one down there, thanks. Peter Parker from the Business Agency. Elmer, you've mentioned a number of times tonight thinking through things and doing what you feel is right. Is there ever a time when your analytical side has come to a different answer to what you feel is right? And how did you resolve that dilemma? Good um, it's, it's a very, very good, good question. Um, first of all, for the big questions, analytics don't usually give you a right or wrong answer. They give you some options. Uh, and you have to evaluate those options based on their attractiveness uh, as well as the probability of success. Uh, so, you know, let's take the Singapore transaction. It might have looked very attractive. I think it was a 40% premium, pretty good. Uh, it lasted 24 hours. So, you know, great option, great analytics, but you couldn't execute, perhaps at that time in the game. Uh, and so, Working through the alternatives and the choices, that requires a lot of input. So you need to be able to listen to other people and you've got to be open to feedback. So I regularly use in the company you know, the word instinct. I say my instinct tells me that that one is right based on all my experience. Uh, and then someone says, well, why would you say that? Because I think that's wrong. It's really important to have a culture where someone feels safe to say to the CEO, actually, I think you're full of something. I think you're wrong. It'd be really helpful if he comes up with a better solution then, as opposed to just you're wrong. But so we spend quite a bit of time debating things. We do that with management, we do it with the board, and to test ideas. Uh, we test it with ourselves, we test it externally, we use investment banks, sometimes consultants, but we don't uh, really need that. Uh, I fly around the world a lot to talk to regulators elsewhere, to my colleagues and other exchanges, so you've got to listen a lot about how other people solve these problems, think about the parallels, and be very open to feedback from the team uh, about what the right answer might be. And then one day you're going to make a decision. And when you make a decision, you've got to go for it and change it if it doesn't work. But you, know, you can't just sit still and keep analyzing. Mm -hmm. right? Analysis paralysis is the worst thing you can do. Uh, and so we do a lot of that um, around some of the more complex questions about how we internationalize our exchange, how we solve some of the competition questions. Because it's, it's, it hasn't been done before. Uh, and you've got to know that that hasn't been done. You've got to learn and listen. What, um, just an extension of that from Philip Seale, um, how would you describe your leadership style oh. in, in all of that? And, and, and why do you think it's There's now a few ASX people here. Maybe we should change microphone and, and ask them. Well, where question. are they? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, and they've all been well trained. <laughs> to, to, sit to, on to, their say, hands to say the right thing. Yeah. Um, Come on, you can give us an answer. Uh, well, I, I, I think. <laughs> I think leadership is not about what you do, it's about people ex how people experience what you do yeah. uh, and what they need. Uh, so uh, uh, some people love ambiguity. Uh, I had a boss uh, at the bank who was very, very good at that. I love that environment because it plays to my nature. Other people hated it. Other people wanted structure, they wanted clear direction, and they could execute brilliantly in that environment. Well, leadership is about knowing that that's what the person needs and giving them what they need in order to succeed. And so a lot about leadership is about choosing your style mm -hmm. uh, to either the situation or the people you're dealing with. Um, it doesn't mean you, you shouldn't be directive. I can be very directive. 
when I feel that that's the only way to get to the answer or to get to a result. But most of the time, other people help you through that. And I think you need to give, you need to give them what they need. Some people in their division need people to bounce things off. They might be young. They might have just been promoted. And so they're struggling with things. Well, you need to give them time and to kick things around. Yeah. Other people need direction, clear KPIs. They want to be managed through results. If that's what they need, that's what you have to give them. Uh, and so leadership is about knowing what they need in order to succeed and, then, and also rounding them out and developing them to make sure that they start to round off the yeah. sharp edges and balance yeah. themselves. Uh, the other thing about leadership is that I think is really important for chief executives, it's really important when to know, to know when to stop leading. Um, and so we did that with, with Tapcorp. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I knew it was time. Yeah. Uh, and you gotta know when it's time. And you gotta just say, I, I left ANZ. You know, the, the phone call I made to my boss uh, was, and I'm not talking, it's a long time ago, and we're very good friends. I rang him up and I said, John, it's, he, was, he was away, so I could only do it by phone, very impolite. I rang him up and I said, John, I'd like to come and see you. Well, that's like that giveaway. So he said, okay, what is it? He said, I only said, I said, John, it's time. That's all I said. And he said, I understand, and I assume there's no point talking about it. That's what he said. And I think it's, those moments are really important. Uh, it's really important to know when to, when to stop leading uh, and give it to someone else to take it to the next phase because your job is to leave the company in better shape than you found it. Mm. And if you believe that there's a different way of doing it and a better way to do it, well, then you should allow someone to do that mm. and, and find a different way to add value somewhere else. And I think it, that's a lot for me about what leadership is about. What, uh, so taking that, that cue, because we're wrapping up now, what's the ASX that you're going to leave in years to come? What's it going to look like and how, how are you going to leave it that way? I think we have a, wonder, a truly a wonderful business, the foundation. You know when CEOs walk into companies and you know, they, then, they come out and they say, what was my predecessor thinking? Honestly, I mean, that was just terrible. We have to change everything. Uh, nothing could be further from the truth in this case. I won't talk about the past, that's impolite. Um, but nothing, I mean, my predecessor ran a wonderful, wonderful company. He also ran it in a different time. Uh, this is a much more competitive time, a more complex time, a much more externally focused time. I'd like to have a company that's extraordinarily successful and profitable, that's respected by its customers for what we serve, what we deliver to them, because the world is no longer, you know, you can polish my shoes to deal with the ASX, I'm going to charge you a fortune for doing it, those days are gone. That is respected by government and is well connected to the rest of the world, because I think we need to, I'd like to be known for one of the businesses that connects Australia to the rest of the world in a way that nobody else has been able to do in a five to 10 year period. And in the meantime, we've got a fantastic business to run, but I think there's a bigger future for Australia. There's a bigger future for our company. One day we've got to get to it. And in the meantime, the best thing we can do is to run it well, work much harder with our customers than we have before. Because uh, actually results doesn't sound sexy, but they're really important. Uh, and so getting the results Working with our clients is very important, but I think there's a bigger future for our country and a bigger future for our company that we need to get to, and, and I'm determined to get to it. Okay, so watch this space by the sounds of that, I think. Um, our time is up, unfortunately. Um, would you please put your hands together and, and thank Omar and Patricia? I hope that was useful. <laughs>